Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Welcome to our worship this Easter Sunday. Whether you worship here very regularly, only occasionally, or whether you are visiting with us this Easter Sunday morning, a warm welcome to our worship and an invitation to come for refreshments, which are served outside the Thorburn West Hall at the close of our worship. Notices just there as, as printed. Again, I would just like to emphasize thanks to all those who assisted with the floral decorations for church for our Easter Sunday service. Uh, a lot of ladies and some men as well were very busy for virtually all yesterday morning. And so thanks to them for the way they have beautified the sanctuary uh, this Easter Sunday morning. And thanks too to all those who helped with the arrangements for our uh, Easter sunrise service at Elbow Beach at 6.30 this morning. Uh, I have to say, having been up since five o'clock, I was inclined to say good afternoon rather than good morning, because it does feel slightly like that. But thank you, thank you for all who assisted, assisted with that. And as you'll see, um, the church is open this afternoon if there are friends or visitors you'd like to bring to the church to see them decorated uh, for, for Easter. Um, other notices, next Saturday morning, at the beginning of what's going to be a monthly clean-up to try and get the church and the grounds in better shape. That's for anyone who's able to come along from, from 9 o'clock. And then in the evening, uh, there's a trivia night quiz from, from 6.30. Now, there's not too many tickets being sold for that yet, and I know the huge amount of work that John Faella has to put in uh, to, to organize a quiz and to arrange all the questions. So if you haven't yet signed up for that, please think about it and come along next uh, Saturday evening. Um, don't worry about coming last. If you do, there's a quiz for the ones that come last, so there's no embarrassment about that. So if you're able to come and support that, please, please give it thought and, 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 bring along, and bring along friends. In our worship this morning, for Easter Sunday, we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion, which all are invited to receive. On this Easter Sunday, let us worship God. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. In 410, Jesus Christ is risen today.
I am the living one. I was dead, and now I am alive forevermore. Our opening prayer. Please be seated. Please join with me in prayer. Holy God, outside the tomb, beside the angels peering into the grave, we stand perplexed at a love so great, so deep to suffer for us, to die for us, and yet not leave, but rise to tell a new story, a different story, not just for you, but for each one of us. A new story for Peter, who confessed he denied he knew you, as we too confess the days, the hours, the distractions, the business, the pressures, the selfishness that say to the world, we do not know the man. We confess and we are sorry. We look for you not in the tomb, but out in the world, living with us. A new story for Mary, who confessed her past and her present fears as we too confess. The failures and the disappointments, the forgotten gifts, the unused talents that say to us and to others, we are too unworthy to act. We confess and we are sorry. We look to serve you now, forgetting the past and looking to the future walking with you. A new story for Paul, who confessed he persecuted the church, as we too confess our lack of love for the church and her people, the frustrations, the impatience that say to one another, we have too little love. We confess and we are sorry. We look at one another afresh and ask for faith to increase that we might be as light, serving you outside the tomb, beside the angels peering into the grave, an unlikely place for a journey to begin, yet you offer us a place to say sorry, to confess the past, to walk into the garden and beyond, forgiven, renewed, our steps made lighter by the life you live and offer us in fullness. Christ our Lord, risen for our salvation. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, boys and girls, it's not just Easter Sunday, it's also Spaghetti Sunday when we gather spaghetti. So as you come down the front, if there's any of the congregation have pasta or anything with them, please collect it on your way down and come down to the front for a moment. There we are, and the pasta can go over in the, in the corner there beside the, beside the font. Lovely. Right, it's lovely to see you all on this, this Easter Sunday morning. Tell me, do you enjoy parties? Do you like parties? Yes. Who's had a party recently? Yeah. You had a birthday, didn't you? You had a birthday last week. Okay, nine? You were nine? Yes, growing up, growing up, right. When you, invite, when you have a party, who do you invite to your party? Your friends? Yeah. Your daddy? That's good, because he's probably paying for it, so that's not a bad <laughs> thing to do. Family members, that's right. I'm going to tell you this morning about a, a different sort of party. We're going to be hearing a reading. You hear it as well because you're staying in a little bit longer today so that your Sunday school teachers or CCY teachers can stay in as well um, 
for the for the message, the Easter for the Easter message. So this is a story you're going to be hearing, written a long, long time ago, by a man who was a prophet, and he was called Isaiah. Isaiah. And one day he wrote that one day there was going to be a really special party. And this party was going to be in Jerusalem, and it was going to be on one of the hills on which Jerusalem is built, and it's called Mount Zion, Mount Zion. And Mount Zion was a special place because that was seemed to be a special place where people could feel God's with them, that he was there with them. And he said, one day there's going to be a party there, and it's going to be the finest food. What kind of food do you have at your party? Cake. Cake. More cake. Ice cream. Ice cream. Right, well, this is Jerusalem, so I don't know if they had ice cream because it was also quite a long time ago. Yes. Cupcakes. Cupcakes, right, okay. Well, I'm not sure if that's what he had in mind, but he reckoned there was going to be the best food you could imagine, the, the, the finest food at this party, or the finest drinks at the party. But do you know what was different about this party? Everybody, but everybody was invited. He said all nations would come, all peoples would come from all over to the special city of Jerusalem and share the food and the drinks together. And it would be a time of great peace. And that was, that was his dream. And that's strangely what we celebrate today. It's a new way of, of living with one another. And we're going to be thinking in our service later on about the ways we do live in this world and about the things that we do that are different from that. Because there are places in the world where there is war, there's places where there is fighting, there's places where there is hungry, there's places where some are invited and some are not. There's lots of divisions, lots of people being kept separate rather than brought together. And what we celebrate this morning, on Easter Sunday morning, is the dream of people being brought together, not kept apart, and sharing in the one big party, the one big meal with the finest foods and the finest drinks and celebrating God's gifts that aren't just for some of us, but for all of us. That's part of our celebration this morning. And we have a way of remembering that because there were people who did not want to live that way. They wanted to divide people up. They wanted to treat some people harshly. They just wanted to invite some and not others. And when Jesus taught them that that was wrong, they had him done away with and eventually put in a tomb. And the tomb was sealed with a large stone. And we remember that stone today with what? Eggs. Eggs. Easter eggs. Easter eggs. And so we remember all the good things that Jesus taught, they thought they had locked in the tomb and in the darkness of the tomb, and that was the end of the story. And it wasn't the end of the story, because when some of the women that were followers of Jesus and some of his disciples went there in the morning, the stone had been rolled away, and the tomb was empty, and Jesus wasn't trapped in there, but he was alive in the world again. And so we remember that today with Easter eggs, don't we? And later on, right, later on, you're going to be searching for for Easter eggs. And it's nice to remember that the Easter egg didn't manage to to seal the tomb because it was rolled away. Can we break it like this? We'd like to have a try. (laughs) Use your hand up first, on you go. Right. Just crush it if you can. There you go. And you'll find there's chocolate here. And there's chocolate. I've been doing this for years on Easter Sunday. (laughs) And distributing chocolate to the children. And our young grandson back in Scotland, who was four, was taken by my wife, Judy, by his grand to a nursery service during the week at the church in North Berwick. And he went along as part of the nursery with the primary ones. And the minister broke the egg. And there was no chocolate and there was nothing inside it. And he said, nothing inside it and no chocolate. So here's some chocolate. And I think you'll find some more eggs as you travel around now. That's to be shared, right? <laughs> <laughs> Remember the message. 
Cheers, by all. <laughs> We're going to sing the children's song. We're going to sing their song. Sometimes the message doesn't always get through. I danced in the morning when the world was begun, 404. I should have perhaps intimated that we're only going to sing verses 1, 4, and 5. <laughs> one went fine, but the rest of the time you were singing 2 and 3, and they were singing 4 and 5. <laughs> we're going to finish by all together singing verse 5. One more verse, Oliver. Verse 5. <clears throat> they cut me down and I leapt up high. I am the life that'll never, never die. I'll live in you if you live in me. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. back to your seats, sit with your families for the moment, okay? You're going to be in church a little while longer. We continue our worship with the readings from the Old Testament. Hear the word of God proclaimed in the Old Testament. The first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 6 to 9. You'll find it on page 652 in the Old Testament of the Bible in the pew. On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, 
and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Thanks be to God. Amen. The choir will sing the anthem, and can it be...
The Gospel for today is the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 16 and at verse 1, page 54 in your pew Bibles. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus. Very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee, There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. May God bless to us the reading of his holy word, and to his name be the praise and the glory. Amen. Hymn 411, Christ the Lord is risen today. Hymn 411. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The beginnings of an understanding of Easter really take us back a week to what we know now as Palm Sunday. As I reflected last week, to the two processions that were entering Jerusalem on that day. From the east, from the coast of Israel, 
from Caesarea Maritima, where the governor Pilate was based, he traveled to Jerusalem with his soldiers to reinforce the garrison who were permanently based in Jerusalem. For Pilate and the governors before and after him, they preferred the coastal resort of Caesarea Maritima to the, the hostility that was always present in Jerusalem. But at Passover time, a potential flashpoint of insurrection, of revolution, a time of nationalistic and patriotic feeling, it was necessary for Pilate and his soldiers to travel to Jerusalem and to enter the city. And in doing so, they represented something very particular. They represented the, the power and the might of the Roman Empire. It's military might. It's economic might. It's political might. It was a forceful sign to the people of Judea that they were an occupied country, that they were under the subjugation of Rome and its vast empire. And under that, people struggled with a, a sense of oppression. It is all symbolized in that procession into Jerusalem. And on the other side of the city, coming down from the Mount of Olives, having traveled up from Jericho, was Jesus and his disciples and many who would have traveled to Jerusalem from Galilee and other parts of Judea for Passover time. And they saw this man, Jesus of Nazareth, whom many would have listened to during his ministry in the Galilee. They saw him arriving in Jerusalem, not with soldiers and on horseback, but on a donkey. And that would have resonated with them. It would have taken them back to the great prophet Zechariah and his prophecy that one day a man would rise, ride into Jerusalem in such a manner and he would be a man of peace. And so on one side of the city, Pilate and the domination of the empire that all he represented, and on the other side, Jesus on the donkey come as a man of peace. And of course, as the week unfolded, the confrontation between the two intensified. On the one hand, Jesus and his ongoing ministry and teaching, and on the other side, not just Pilate, but the high priesthood, appointed by him, chosen from the aristocracy to ensure the smooth running of the temple and of Jerusalem itself. The confrontation intensified, intensified to the stage where Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. The disciples flee. Judas has betrayed him. Peter was to deny him. And ultimately, it was to lead to his trial, his sentence, his execution, and his crucifixion. And then we turn to the gospel for today. And in many respects, a strange gospel. Mark, the earliest of the gospels, tells us that early in the morning at sunrise, some of the women went to the tomb in order to anoint Jesus' body with the spices that they had bought and find the stone rolled away. The tomb is empty. In itself, there is nothing particularly significant about that. Many reasons might and could have been given. But they are told by a messenger there, an, an angel, a messenger of God, that he is not there. He has gone before them. Tell the disciples that he will meet them in Galilee as he had promised. And we're told that the women were terrified. They were awestruck. And curiously, and they told no one because they were afraid. What's curious about that is that the ancient manuscripts tell us is that that's where Mark's gospel ends. The women said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. The early church in the second century, in the second century, if you look at your Bibles, added a couple of endings. A short ending and a longer ending, following in a sense both Matthew and, and Luke and John, who in their Gospels record the resurrection appearances of Christ. In Mark's Gospel, there is no 
resurrection appearance. Simply the instruction to the disciples and Peter, and Peter, that he will see them in Galilee as he had promised. And so the early church didn't find that terribly satisfactory. And so appearances of the risen Christ were added in in the second century to the gospel of St. Mark. But why did Mark end his gospel in a sense in such a strange way? Strange way? Well, perhaps it's, it's this, because the angel says to the, the women there, there, you are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. If you like, it's Mark's emphasis on the very fact that the one who was raised was indeed the one who was crucified. And there could be no separation. The disciples went through hope and expectation in the course of Jesus' ministry to disappointment and despair and indeed grief. And in Mark's gospel, there's a sense that the disciples had to fully experience the death of Jesus before they could experience his resurrection. The two belong together. The one who was raised was indeed the one who was crucified. And they're left to ponder on the meaning of his being raised up and the empty tomb. And in time they came to realize through their own experiences that what was happening here was God's yes to Jesus and all that he represented and no to the forces and the powers that had him done away with. If you like, it was a yes to the procession of the man who entered in Jerusalem as a man of peace and a no to the representatives of the powers of dominion and subjugation and oppression. The earliest creed of the church is not the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. The earliest creed of the church was a very simple one. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And what that, in a sense, simply meant was that Caesar is not. Caesar, nor Pilate, nor any of the representatives of the Roman Empire, or indeed any representative of any empire that seeks to dominate and oppress and subjugate its own people and others. I share with you the story that I shared with others earlier this morning of a man called Nikolai Ivanovich Bukharin. He may or may not be familiar to you. He was one of the Bolshevik revolutionaries in Russia in 1917. He became one of the leading figures in the Politburo. He was the editor of Pravda, which ironically means truth. And he, came, he arose to a position of great influence in the new government of the Soviet Union. The story is told that in 1930, he traveled to the city of Kiev and there amassed, there addressed a huge gathering that had massed in one of the stadiums there. And the purpose of his address was to convince the crowds, the peasants of the, of the rural areas round about, the working ordinary folks there, was to convince them that the faith, their own faith and the faith of their forefathers for Russia had been a Christian country for almost a thousand years, that that faith was a false faith, it was mistaken, and to convert them to the tenets of communism and atheism. And the story goes that he spoke to them for an hour, ridiculing the Christian faith, denigrating it, and expounding the virtues of this new communist and atheistic philosophy. And at the end of it, at the end of the hour, felt reasonably convinced that he had demonstrated to them the error of their ways, and that they would depart from this historically held Christian faith. And there are different versions of the story at this point. One version is that the Russian priest then took the stage, another version is that it was simply one of the congregation. And he took to the podium, and he looked at the mass crowd in front of him, in front, to his right, and to his left. He paused, and then he addressed them. Christ is risen. And the thunderous echo came back. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. 
in a sense, we still have that choice today as to which procession we would choose to join. The one that is representative of domination and oppression, or the one that is representative of this man of peace and his message of reconciliation and inclusion and the overcoming of divisions. As a footnote, I might add that Nikolai Ivanovich Bukharin was eventually executed in the orders of his old friend and colleague, Stalin. He was indeed part of the system of domination and oppression and violence and paid perhaps the price of it. But while not being in exactly the same situation, we still have the choices today of the procession that we would choose to join and the values that we would incorporate into our own lives. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue our worship with the giving of our offering. And before our dedication and our prayer for others, would the children like to stand and I offer a blessing upon them before they go out to CCY? Would you like the children all stand up? There we are. A blessing on our children. Loving God, as our children go from here, may they go with your blessing, knowing your peace and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. I think there's something organized for you. It might be around the theme of eggs.
Let us pray. Almighty God, in your name we dedicate this, our offering, praying that it may be a symbol of our commitment to live in your ways and to work for the signs and the growth of your kingdom. In our prayers this day, we remember others. We pray for our families and our friends, wherever they will spend this Easter day, and ask for your blessing upon them, that they may know your peace. We pray for those whom we know by name and whom we know to be in need at this time, whether through illness, loneliness, and anxiety, those who have been bereaved. May they be touched by your healing spirit. And we pray for those whose names are unknown to us but known and loved by you in need this Easter day those who are oppressed by their fellow human beings, who suffer under them, those who live in divided societies and communities, unable to overcome the divisions and the past legacies of history, those caught up in the midst of war and violence and terrorism, the ugliness that so scars the beauty of this, your world. We pray for the millions of refugees those entrapped, living in squalor and in poverty. We pray for a greater peace in this, your world, and pray that we may all follow the ways of peace and the ways taught to us. And we remember also those who struggle this day will be with poverty in a world of plenty. May we commit ourselves to a fairer sharing of the world's resources. We pray too for your church this day, for the life of this congregation, for your church on this island, for the church in the world, made up of men and women like ourselves, like the disciples with faults and failings, yet seeking to commit ourselves to a renewed faith. May we all in our individual lives be agents of reconciliation, of peace and of justice, seeking to overcome all that divides us, your human family. And we remember always, with thanksgiving, those no longer with us, but whose love we were privileged to know and to receive. May we never think them far away, for we share a fellowship and communion with them still, through the mystery, the wonder of that fellowship and communion that we have with you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Draw near to the holy table and hear the gracious words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. In 416, Christ is alive, let Christians sing.
Blessed are you, Lord God of the universe. You are a giver of this bread, fruit of the earth and of human labor. Let it become the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of the universe. You are the giver of this wine, fruits of the vine and of human labor. Let it become the wine of the eternal kingdom. As the grain once scattered on the fields and the grapes once dispersed on the hillside are now reunited on this table in bread and wine, so, Lord, may your whole church soon be gathered together from the corners of the earth into your kingdom. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Therefore, with your people of all places and times, and with the whole company of heaven, we proclaim your greatness and sing your praises in the angel's song. Almighty God, all power is yours. You created the heavens and established the earth. You sustain in being all that is. In Christ your Son, our life and yours came together. He made his home among us that we might forever dwell in you. Through your Holy Spirit, you call us to new birth in a creation restored by love. May this life-giving spirit transfigure this thanksgiving meal, that this bread and wine may become for us the body and blood of Christ, and we may be kindled with the fire of your love and renewed for the service of your kingdom. May this creator spirit accomplish the words of your beloved Son, who on the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. United by one baptism, in the same Holy Spirit and the same body of Christ, we pray together now and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Jesus told his apostles, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The bread which we break is the communion in the body of Christ. The cup of blessing for which we give thanks is the communion in the blood of Christ. Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world. Right. Take, eat. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Do this in remembrance of him. This cup is the new covenant in the blood of Christ. Drink from it, all of you, in remembrance of him. the gifts of God to his people.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we give thanks for this sacrament in bread and wine, symbols of a life shared, a life given, a life sacrificed. We thank you too for the invitation to this, your holy table, and for the greater invitation to participate in the very life of Christ in our own time and here in this place, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hymn 419, Thine be the glory, risen conquering Son. Hymn 419. And now go in peace, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this Easter day and always.